war, call it what we might, but war is the most complex of human endeavors. I've thought a lot about the use of the military instrument of power, and in particular, whether it's more appropriate to be cautious or aggressive with right. it. When I talk about making strategy in public, it's the recognition that uh, the decisions we make are immediately um, visible and evident to l large numbers of people, and not just at home, but across the globe. Roger. Hey, you got that. That could take you in one of two directions. You could either become more aggressive or you can become more cautious about that. I, I will leave it to historians to decide whether we've become more aggressive or more cautious in the face of this proliferation of, of awareness and information. When I talk to our elected officials, I talk about options and I talk about whether we're in a period that requires either a bias for action or a bias for inaction. But what we can allow this proliferation of information to do is generate an almost insatiable appetite for more information and more options, which can actually paralyze the system. That's the risk we run, is that y you, you, know, you begin to believe that if you just wait a little longer, you'll even have more information, right. and more information is better information and it becomes kind of a, a cycle that uh, is tough to, to, uh, to break. When conflict starts out of either fear or honor, uh, and in the case of current conflicts of, of certain of them, of religion, you know, the, the, the ability to manage those conflicts becomes much more difficult, much more challenging. So caution, is not a pejorative, in my view, in the application of force. On the other hand, I mentioned a little earlier that the use of the military instrument is different whether you're dealing with a nation state or a peer competitor or a non or sub-state group. My point is this, if you have a universal bias for inaction, that can become problematic. Right. I think you have to balance, given the threat given the other pressures on the system, in our case, given the other commitments we have, I think you have to be very uh, judicious in balancing your tendency to go into action and your tendency to wait and see if other opportunities present themselves. office I worked for prided in taking cases that were difficult and uh, I listened to a person tell me about the facts uh, regarding the use of weapon electronic weaponry and uh, had a discussion with somebody else in the law firm and we came to this conclusion that causation 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 Greg remember that element it's going to be awfully difficult to uh, link what's happening to the person the injuries they were alleging to actually uh, the person or the uh, defendants that were doing it. So it was a case, uh, I, I, I'll be very honest with you, I uh, was very skeptical over. But as a journalist, I started to interview uh, a number of people, and I would like to say that this issue, after a number of years, has come up to one of the top in my list as a problem in our country. I've talked to hundreds of people all around the country who are uh, experiencing things that are just unbelievable. Uh, and from a standpoint of uh, the law, you want to get justice for these people. You hate to see their lives destroyed. You hate to see what happens to a person that's been uh, harassed. But the biggest problem is it's very difficult to pinpoint what's going on. Uh, I have a guest today who's an expert in this field. You, uh, the public, may not know who she is, but those of you who have been targeted and listened to my show know very well. Uh, she's never uh, interviewed before, uh, and I feel honored that she's here. Her name is Julian McKinney. She is, uh, uh, had an extensive career in the U.S. Army as an Area Intelligence Case Officer until 1990. Upon her return to civilian life, Julian became a member of the Association of the National Security Alumni. That is an organization of former intelligence officers dedicated to exposing excesses by the U.S. intelligence services. Julian became the director of the Electronics Surveillance Project under their auspices, and such, she authored the publication 
microwave harassment and mind control experimentation in 1991. She kept that electronic surveillance project going for four years by funding it with her own personal funds obtained through her military benefits uh, pay. Julian did not copyright her work, and it is out in the public domain for the public uh, good. Microwave harassment and mind control experimentation. The public has taken her hard copy publication and uploaded it to several thousand domain sites over the past 15 years. It is still respected as one of the most important publications on this subject. And with that, I'd like to say hello, uh, Ms. McKinney, how are you today? Please don't call me Ms. McKinney. <laughs> okay, can I say Julian? Yes, Julian. Now you're an expert in surveillance and electronic harassment. And the first question I have, is it your observation that there is a wider scale of surveillance of average people? Uh, people with no threat to the national security, in your estimation? I would say that uh, most of those targeted are not and never have been a threat. I think that uh, what happened initially when these operations began probably 30 years ago, <clears throat> people were singled out perhaps because of some affiliation, either direct or indirect, with uh, the United States government. Uh, and invited in attention, but they were not singled out as being threats. They were singled out as being uh, lucrative targets of experimentation. Um, in the past 15 years, since shutting down the electronic surveillance project, primarily to seek employment, which I did seek and did obtain, uh, I had occasion to observe many, many, many instances of individuals in the corporate environment being singled out uh, and targeted simply because they were convenient uh, targets of opportunity. And uh, I have to comment on something I heard you say okay. um, early on. Uh, you re referred to the difficulty of uh, establishing causation in order to pursue these claims. And, that, and I might add, that was made in a legal sense uh, based on the fact that uh, we were naive people, not really understand. I'd be honest with you, I had not understood the problem back then and felt it would be a difficult problem just based on the fact of knowing how the crime is committed, mm -hmm. how to pin that crime on someone. Go ahead. Uh, I understand the legal implications, certainly. <clears throat> there is enough literature uh, on the Internet and elsewhere that establishes the existence of these, uh, these weapon systems. Uh, to pinpoint, for purposes of prosecution, to pinpoint their their existence would be difficult. Um, and the position I take is that rather than pinpoint them for prosecution purposes, it's easy enough to uh, single them out by electronic means and to uh, destroy them. Uh, but I guess that's, that's taking the, the matter a little far afield. Um, I think, frankly, we still face, until Congress establishes laws <clears throat> that forbid the use of these technologies for involuntary experimental purposes, um, that we're going to get absolutely nowhere uh, in attempting to prosecute. Okay. Are Listen, I need to take a break, uh, Julian, and we'll be back in three minutes on the Investigative Journal. Okay. Okay, back for the second half hour. My, je my guest is uh, Julian McKinney. She's an expert uh, on surveillance and electronic harassment. And Julian, I gave you an introduction at the uh, beginning of the show, yeah. brief introduction, but I think our listeners would like to know your background and why you're qualified uh, to make these statements. Uh, I think it's important. Okay. If you could do that, please. Uh, well, I would take exception to the term uh, expert in these weapon systems. Okay. Uh, I certainly have had experience with them. Uh, having for approximately the past 40 years been on the receiving end of this type of harassment. Okay. Um, expertise in surveillance comes with my uh, employment in the intelligence field. I understand what, uh, what constitutes surveillance. I'm capable of immediately spotting a surveillance, and I can see, as in the case of gang stalking, as a subject which you have addressed on prior occasions, uh, I can see those who... Uh, uh, I label as uh, covert wannabes, uh, bumbling and stumbling through what they think are covert uh, activities and find it really rather amusing if it weren't so uh, perverted in, in uh, uh, the ultimate objective. Um, I'm not certain what 
more I can add. Uh, I do have experience with these weapon systems. I've had sufficient opportunity, opportunity over these past many years to observe the uh, progressive spread uh, of uh, these uh, harassment operations, and I'm, I'm talking specifically about uh, electronic weapon systems. Well, you've been a, a voice, I mean, a strong voice for warning people of these systems for at least the past 10 years uh, regarding the installation of specialized electronic equipment and utilities. What are these electronics, and what are their capabilities? Their capabilities generally um, are to inflict pain in highly focused fashion um, and to uh, alter mental states. Certainly when you have a frequency aimed at your brain, um, uh, your, your mental functions tend to alter. Um, in amplified form, they're sufficient. Uh, the the, the uh, frequencies are, have the capacity to uh, kill. So that's why, one reason why the Department of Defense refers to them as less than lethal rather than non-lethal weapons. As a matter of fact, the Department of Defense has gone so far as to eliminate them, uh, to remove them from the category of even less than lethal weapons and to bury them under the uh, category of uh, electronic weapons, trying to make them a little bit uh, blacker. Now, is this protocol of surveillance and harassment seemingly patterned uh, after a government protocol now applied to the general civilian population? It's difficult to pinpoint everything at this stage on the U.S. government exclusively because these are global operations. Okay. The pattern, the protocols uh, are virtually identical on a global scale. So someone is overseeing the entire activity. Uh, the government obviously is complicit because otherwise these, these operations would not be allowed to exist. Why? Is it, it's hard to say whether it's uh, uh, for testing uh, uh, electronic weapon systems for future use under uh, combat conditions or whether ultimately there's a holocaust in the offing, it's hard to say. Well, you know what I find interesting? Uh, uh, how people who aren't aware of this problem uh, can't believe it happened to begin with. And I, I try to mention, I, I, I had run stories about uh, stories about the Duplessis orphans. Uh, it's a program that's ju that's been verified that the government uh, actually used money in Canada and the United States to use to do medical testing on children, mm -hmm. uh, on children. adults. Uh, I've talked to people in the POW issue. One uh, Dr. Uh, uh, excuse me, Dr. Joe Douglas, who has documented how the, our government has done allowed foreign governments to do illegal experimentation on POWs. Mm -hmm. So now why would people think they wouldn't allow it on just average citizens? Just in your mind, what do you have an answer for people? Uh, and what do you why think about they that? allow it? Yeah, I mean, I, my thing is they do it, they're doing it, but some people that deny it can't believe that our government would do something like this. Right? You'll find, uh, even among the community of, uh, uh, I, I hate using slang terms, but the term TI is common, referring to targeted individuals. Okay. Uh, those those are people who fully realize that they are on the they are on the receiving end of uh, uh, electronic uh, weapons systems. But even amongst TIs, <clears throat> there is the perception in certain areas that our government would not do this. Uh, a case of not recognizing reality. First of all, if this were not being done by, by our government, Congress would step in because of the hundreds of complaints they have received, thousands of complaints, no doubt, over the past 10, 15 years from citizens who recognize what's going on. Congress, back in the early 90s, late 80s, took the position that anyone complaining about these systems uh, were, imag were imagining things because we didn't, they simply didn't exist within Two years, by 1992, they were off the drawing boards and, in fact, uh, being fielded and, and uh, uh, conveyed to law enforcement agencies. Congress recognizes that these weapons systems exist and funds them and knows, as a result of appropriate briefings, what the effects, bioeffects can be, yet they have passed no legislation prohibiting their use under unconstrained experimental uh, circumstances. That's number one. Number two, given the nature, given that these systems draw on existing power grids, it would be necessary for the uh, 
the FCC as a minimum and the Department of Energy as a minimum to have some oversight and control uh, over what is going on. So obviously, uh, those uh, with Congress, the FDA, and the uh, 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 Department of Energy, the FCC and the, the uh, Department of Energy are knowledgeable and yet unwilling to do anything about it. So there is complicity. But the question is, uh, who's bidding? At whose bidding is the U.S. government uh, allowing this, these operations to uh, take place? Now, from your experience, how intense is this surveillance of targeted individuals? And tell us about the ways that the targeted uh, this is accomplished. From what I have observed, first of all, I should explain that the standard, as I, as I addressed this in uh, uh, microwave harassment and mind control experimentation, there was a pattern that was unfolding when I was dealing with uh, uh, other targeted individuals who uh, had contacted me. There was a pattern of harassment which indicated that there had been some surveillance going on, some monitoring of their private lives. There had been entry into their houses. There was systematic harassment, and then ultimately, as part of a softening up process, and then ultimately electronic harassment would follow, which would include uh, uh, the inducement of auditory input, which which is now being referred to as V2K. Um, in answer to your question, uh, <laughs> I'm not certain if I, uh, I think I'm probably missing the point there, but uh, um, in order to target someone, it requires that that person be put under surveillance under, so that their personality traits, their, their capacity to interrelate with people, their capacity for corruption or non-corruption, that seems to be a, a critical point, uh, and even their religion factors into it. Uh, following a period of harassment, they are singled out for preliminary stages of harassment, which would include gang stalking, entry of their, their private homes and apartments, um, followed by gradually intensified and ultimately extremely intensified electronic harassment. This, this is a pattern that has unfolded over and over and over. You've been following this for years and years and years. Is there any way that you can give our listeners a kind of an idea of how, per, how widespread this problem is in terms of uh, numbers in our country and, and compared to maybe overseas? Well, I would say that the persons who have realized what's going on are just a drop in the bucket. The persons whom I have seen being targeted are completely unaware of what's happening. So uh, those who are complaining of this are, are, are as I said, a tip of, of the iceberg. I would say this is probably very, very widespread. Uh, but I can't, under, those, uh, under the circumstances, uh, come up with any figures. Uh, many, many, many thousands, no doubt, are involved, but I would say that the bulk of those are running to their doctors and taking totally unnecessary prescription drugs to cure ailments that, in fact, uh, don't exist. I guess uh, that you have to ask this question, even though it's very difficult to answer, and you mentioned, you, you said it earlier, but I, I really have to ask it because it's on my mind, and I know it's always in the back of everyone's mind when they try and think of this problem. Why? Uh, what is the major re I mean, outside of just the pure experimentation, I, I'm interested, for example, let's say they had targeted 100 people in uh, Oklahoma. What are they, first of all, why are they doing it? Is it for some, uh, is it for basically uh, a, a blanket statement controlling the population? Or, uh, and what do they do with this information once they get it? I don't think they do anything with the information once they get it other than to establish a, har a harassment protocol with, uh, uh, which will follow that targeted individual for the rest of his or her life. Um, why are they doing it? I see a number of reasons. First, um, I don't know if you've done any research on the phenomenon of uh, capturing a percentage of the population in order to install a dictatorship. There, always, there is always a percentage of the population, roughly 20% or so, who will buckle and uh, throw whatever constitutions might exist into the toilet.
toilet and eagerly uh, join the, the effort at destroying the remainder of the uh, population. Part of the problem or part of the objectives that they're, they are seeking, obviously, is testing the, the latest and greatest in electronic weaponry uh, and uh, other forms of technologies. Um, a part of it is to control and choreograph those who are involved in these harassment operations on the dispensing end. And it would appear that those being targeted are, are simply objects uh, who I see as ultimately being disposable. In other words, I think that once full control is established over a major percentage of the population, uh, and enough of the population is silenced and unwilling to stick their necks out, that we inevitably would be heading toward a holocaust. Uh, the question, I, if I was, for example, let's say we have a, a person who suspects, and let's just for, for hypothetical purposes say this person is being targeted, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, tell our listeners, because I've always wondered this myself, okay, I'm sitting in my house, and I see around me there's telephone poles, there may be a tower in the in the distance that I don't see that handles uh, the cell phones uh, there's of course a grid of electric uh, going on around me uh, I've talked to people and I try to say how does this get into your house and I wanted to get your opinion on if a person is targeted how basically are they uh, beginning to intrude their premises and uh, uh, violate their constitutional rights, not only their uh, rights of, uh, um, you know, not only trespassing uh, on their property? Go ahead. How would that happen? Now, are you talking about how would the frequencies impact upon them and how would they first become aware of it or how would they first become aware of the fact that their privacy has been violated? Well, no, I guess I didn't explain the question right. I guess I wanted to know how they physically are doing it. I mean, are they using the? Uh, are they using a cell tower? Are they using a truck that's in the distance? How is this being transmitted into the home to target the person and to use this weaponry on them from your experience? Well, first of all, in order to target a person, you have to be able to see that person. And while they may not be able to, um, they may, on entering the house, have implanted miniature cameras, miniature microphones, as a means of uh, further monitoring the person. But that not, is not necessarily the means by which they home in on a person. There are plenty of technologies that allow for the imaging of a person who might be sitting in a chair, as you mentioned, you might be. be. Um, using infrared um, uh, imagery techniques, for example, uh, they can capture your image uh, by monitoring the, the concentration of heat emanating from your body using certain acoustical frequencies. They can detect mass. Um, and using sophisticated uh, 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 computer software, they can convert those images to um, likenesses on computers, uh, which conceivably could be used in a software program that would uh, be connected to a, uh, a uh, an electronic weapon system. And in that context, I should point out that devices, while devices draw on the existing power grid, and while they, yes, indeed, they do involve uh, uh, microwave towers. Sounds like you've got a commercial coming on. Yeah, we do. And thank you for making my job easier. We'll be back in three minutes on the Investigative Journal. Just, uh, I've put this in the top uh, three of my stories that I believe are important uh, that the American people need to deal with. Because as Miss McKinney, who is, uh, I consider her an expert, she would only say she's an authority, but let me tell you, Julian, you are an expert in this. Uh, the reasons could be, uh, like she said at the, uh, before we went into the break, and uh, total uh, uh, testing of our population to see, basically, uh, perhaps maybe there is a Holocaust in the future or a dictatorship in the future, and they want to see how people react to it. That may be a simplistic way to look at it. 
but it, uh, the, not the simplistic way that Julian looked at it, but my way of explaining it. But let's get back to some of the, uh, the things here in the last few minutes that are important. Uh, what can you tell us, Julian, about the use of microwave energy on citizens in terms of the existence of such a program and the nuts and bolts of what they do? Um, microwave energy is only one aspect of the entire electromagnetic uh, frequency spectrum. Um, microwaves can be lethal depending on, upon uh, how they're used. Obviously, in order to achieve appropriate effects on people, they have to be pulsed because otherwise the individual would be uh, cooked from the inside out. The objective of using microwaves as opposed to other electromagnetic uh, frequencies would be to inflict extremes of pain to cause thermal heating. Uh, that's a common complaint, which leaves a hot spot on the skull. Um, and again, primarily just to inflict extremes of pain. Uh, I was just wondering, we kind of uh, skipped over or didn't quite complete a preceding topic. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. You and can, that was, uh, you have we were talking free about range. use of the, um, the electrical grid okay. uh, throughout the country, uh, the use of microwave towers, um, the use of devices affixed to uh, poles that are connected to power lines. But what wasn't addressed, or what, what you haven't mentioned, is also that these... Um, these weapon systems are used by neighbors surrounding persons who've been singled out as um, um, targets of opportunity. And uh, these How do people... They, do they, are they solicited for to do this or why? That's, uh, that's something that I've been pondering for quite some time. Again, what I've noticed is there seems to be a predominance of a particular religion that makes it particularly easy for them to uh, cooperate. Well, listen, let's uh, let's talk about that after the break. I get a short break, and then I've got something to, uh, uh, some business I have to take care of for three or four minutes, and then we'll get back for our second hour with Julian McKinney. We'll take some calls back in two minutes on the investigative journal by some of the TIs, and that's targeted individuals. Now, that song rose to number one without any publicity uh, on the Internet. Uh, and that song uh, called T.I., we'll play that again, uh, Dr. McKinney. I think it hits the nail on the head. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of people out there suffering. And I know you're one person, uh, an authority in this field, and for my guests who uh, are just picking us up this hour, uh, Dr. Uh, or excuse me, Julianne McKinney is a very highly regarded uh, person in the field of uh, electronic weaponry and surveillance in studying this issue. She's a former area uh, intelligence case officer until 1990 in the Army and her credentials uh, can be found, uh, will be found. You can go to rbnlive.com and go to my archives on the Investigative Journal and read about that, but sh uh, she's well qualified. She's still with us this hour. And uh, doctor, or excuse me, I keep calling you doctor, and you should be. <laughs> I'm not a doctor, thank that's you. That's okay. Uh, uh, emeritus. Dr. Emeritus. <laughs> uh, you know, that's funny. I, I have a doctorate in law. Nobody ever calls me that. I hate being called that, a doctor, but I, I'm interviewed on a Toronto radio sta or TV station once every uh, blue moon a couple months, and they refer to me as Dr. Samansky. And it's nice to hear once in a while. Uh, I'll be honest with you. Uh, every once, every two months is good enough. Otherwise, they just call me the jerk on the radio, uh, which is better. Uh, but let's go from here. You're, you're, you know, you're adding such credibility to this story, adding credibility in my mind as I speak, because I've talked to hundreds of these people. Was it doubting Thomas in the beginning? I must mention that I did not uh, think it existed uh, I and that was years ago I thought people were either insane or crazy or trying to get attention but you know something I will admit I was totally wrong with that initial uh, uh, with that initial uh, uh, I guess the look at the situation and have come around to fully believe in most of the people I talk to and really sympathize with their suffering uh, as I see their lives being ripped apart. Uh, are there any things you can do? We're going to get into a few more things here as far as uh, the technical aspects of this. But uh, what can targeted individuals do to get some peace in their life? I mean, that's one thing they're looking for. 
Is there anything they can do? Um, it's a difficult question. It, <laughs> long, prolonged silence. It's time for another commercial. Uh, it's very difficult to um, uh, advise targeted individuals on how to uh, acquire peace. Uh, these frequencies can be blocked uh, or deflected. All of these frequencies I have found, some may contest this, but I have found can be, are, are vulnerable and are subject to deflection and uh, the pain can be ameliorated if not uh, halted altogether. Um, finding peace by writing to uh, members of Congress or to uh, state legislators uh, might not be the better alternative because uh, you will be treated as um, something worthy of the circular basket. Mm -hmm. um, they just won't intervene. Writing to the various agencies and calling and meeting with them uh, serves no useful purpose either. Uh, because they will say there are no laws prohibiting uh, uh, these types of uh, activities. They can't uh, say, for example, the FBI, and I, I was given this statement on a number of occasions, there are no laws prohibiting experimentation with these weapon systems. Uh, you're talking to the wrong people. Um, so it, my advice would be to do what you can to secure your premises, because so long as your house is, uh, or apartment is being entered, uh, you are susceptible to, in addition to uh, being targeted by electronic weapons, there is the potential for having drugs uh, surreptitiously uh, put in your food. And I'm not exaggerating there. I had a few targeted individuals that I talked to uh, send me some questions they would like to ask you. Uh, Certainly. And one was, are targeted individuals also broadcast around the country via closed circuit TV? And what purposes does this serve? I'm fully in the dark in this question, but go ahead. Okay. Um, I have seen evidence of a closed circuit TV, and it seems to be some form of major source of entertainment and perhaps instruction uh, for uh, the uh, individuals participating in this harassment. Uh, I don't know who runs it. I have seen aspects of it on a large screen TV across the street. Um, on which I saw surveillance films of uh, a TI being harassed, obviously in a um, in a uh, an office environment, gang stalked. Uh, shows brain scans and is otherwise a uh, um, a very sophisticated and sleek uh, uh, communications operation. Uh, why would it be used, as I said, uh, either for entertainment, uh, for um, uh, creating a sense of unity uh, for identifying persons, TIs, who are to be harassed on the street. I mean, obviously you can't harass someone if, uh, if you don't know what that person looks like. So it's a means of communicating to the, uh, the perpetrators, the perps, uh, what a TI looks like. Okay. Now, before I get to some more, when I put out that call for people to call, I got a couple of emails. People now, a lot of times TIs do not want to go public. Uh, and they've sent me some emails. I want to get to one in a minute. Uh, but one question I have for you is uh, how can people uh, gather evidence to support their beliefs that this is happening to them? Uh, many people... Uh, will say, well, it's only a lack of sleep. I mean, you have a sleep disorder. Uh, perhaps there's a problem with your joints. I don't know. It could be <laughs> anything that the answers are when you're, uh, when you suspect you're being targeted. But what kind of evidence do you tell people to gather to support their beliefs that this is actually happening to them? Uh, well, when you're gathering evidence, obviously you have an objective in mind, and that uh, generally is legal. And... Uh, uh, what do you want to do with that evidence? There, there's, uh, there's really nothing you can do with it. But so, in the absence of that, the main thing is to is to try to protect yourself and to alleviate uh, the uh, the pain that you're experiencing. Um, collecting the evidence, if you were to go to, uh, frankly, I strongly recommend. Uh, that you keep your, your faculties together uh, and avoid uh, going to see psychiatrists and psychologists because the 
pattern that is evolving is that they are highly complicit in these operations. And uh, if you go to a medical doctor, you do not talk about under because medical doctors are um, many are also involved. So basically, and what what you do when you see a doctor is that you uh, define your symptoms and get a very clear statement. Well, we can't figure this out. Well, that's a clear indication that um, it, it is not. Uh, um, endogenous, it's not part of your system, it's not coming from within you, then obviously something is happening from outside. If they prescribe drugs and yet can't find the, the uh, etiology, the basis for your disease, um, don't take those drugs. Now earlier we were talking about the fact that they may, uh, who's ever doing this, and we've, you've delineated, a, uh, you've led a good uh, course into what, uh, you know, you're, you're tracking these people. Uh, but what I was getting at, was we never got to the point where if, you, you mentioned something about a religious group that may be targeted. Well. And what did you mean by that? The way, uh, I don't, uh, let me put it this way, I'm not anxious to start a religious war. I have found over the years that the persons involved, both in gang stalking, uh, from, uh, I've, I've made it a point to get to know these people. I've had to, necessarily. I'm, I'm not the type to... Uh, Are you talking about the perpetrators or the targets? Perpetrators. Okay. Uh, as well as the, uh, I've been drawing distinctions. And what I have found is that the perpetrators uh, appear to belong predominantly to one particular religion, whereas uh, the targeted individuals do not belong predominantly to that particular religion. And what is and the particular stage, religion of the perpetrators? Right. So at this stage, uh, again, I'm not particularly enthused about the idea of starting a religious war, uh, and I have challenged other PIs to get out there and get to become acquainted with, get to know the people who are harassing them, to make to draw those distinctions themselves, because I'm I'm not going to be making uh, rash claims. This okay. is something I've observed over the past ten years. That's fair and enough, and we may be perhaps. Uh uh, I could talk to you about it just from my own knowledge off the air, and maybe that would be uh, I'll keep your name out of it at that point and let people know what the, what, uh, the targeted group uh, may be and what the other group may be. There is a religious influence, but that's not to say that these people aren't just being used as puppets by some, uh, some broader interest. Very good point. Can you stick with us one more segment of five minutes? Okay. Okay, looking to Julian McKinney, our last segment, and uh, uh, Julian's a, an authority in the use of uh, sur surveillance and electronic weaponry. And this is a, uh, an email question, a, kind of a technical one, uh, from a TI. And uh, let me read this to you, and perhaps you could answer it. Are the protocols for each individual modified? Uh, based to uh, custom tailor it for the specific targeted individual, and if so, how does this process work? Uh, yes, indeed, they are modified. Uh, there is a basic technology, a basic uh, protocol that uh, uh, the uh, perpetrators begin with, but the PI contributes to the modification. A good example of that would be if someone. Uh, um, I'm trying to think of a good example. Um, if, the, if the TI feels a need to cooperate, even in the most subtle fashion with persons who are um, uh, harassing him or her, uh, he or she will modify uh, his behavior uh, in Pavlovian condition, condition uh, which alters the protocol. They're constantly, tar targets are constantly monitored, and if they respond emotionally to a particular trigger, uh, that will be built into uh, the protocol. If the, if the target displays a certain sense of guilt or embarrassment about a, a subject, that will be built into the protocol. It's an ongoing process. And one thing I want to emphasize is no TI should look for a reason as to why this is going on. It's a serious, serious mistake. I know that it's a natural tendency. I did that myself when they started on me, and over the years, I uh, I came up with probably six different excuses. Is it still going on with you? Oh, yes. 
Um, not to the degree that it, to, it was before, but uh, uh, certainly in very lethal form. Um, and how has it hampered your life? It's it's come close to being lethal on a number of occasions. Um, I deal with uh, I've dealt with gang stalking head on, and uh, essentially put that to uh, to rest. Uh, I, I deal with uh, I, I've developed a means for communicating with uh, perps directly, <clears throat> and for making them feel like the trailer trash that they are. So uh, gang stalking is not one of their favorite activities in my case. Um, the the primary activity uh, uh, now is to see what I can survive in the way of a, an induced brain aneurysm or stroke or uh, or a heart attack. And I just had a caller uh, call me who doesn't want to get on the air, wants to know, does moving help, moving your location? Uh, running, if you're talking about moving to a complete new, uh, completely new location, no. This country is wired uh, to the hilt for immediate transfer. Uh, your protocol follows you wherever you go, so it's a waste of time. <clears throat> Moving about physically in place will not change anything uh, other than if you make a 180 degree turn, you will notice that uh, the targeting will suddenly stop and, and, uh, uh, because it, uh, uh, the uh, weapon systems are programmed to focus on a particular area of your anatomy and if you turn, uh, the targeting will suddenly end. If you turn back, it will hit you again. Now, anyway, going full circle in the last two minutes here, in 1991, you published Microwave Harassment and Mind Control Experimentation. This has been passed around the Internet and over thousands of domain sites over the past 15 years. Can you tell us how someone can get a hold of this uh, publication to be informed? That's not copyrighted. Any, uh, all they need to do is plug in um, uh, my last name, McKinney, and uh, uh, type in the title uh, Microwave Harassment and Mind Control Experimentation, and, and innumerable sites will... Uh, here uh, and uh, just read it uh, from there. Gives you a good insight as to uh, what the pattern is um, when the harassment begins. Now, uh, let me just spell your name so people that are going to do that. That's M C K I N N E Y. That's uh, McKinney. Right. And then it's McKinney. Microwave has Harassment and Mind Control Experimentation from right. an Authority in the Field. Uh, I guess since 1981, have you seen, I guess, the, the an ad, a question I wanted to ask, from 2001, have you seen any, uh, from the time of 9-11, has there been an increase in the last four or five years with this type of, uh, that you've seen, with the number of people contacting you, the uh, uh, widespread, has it been more widespread during this time since 9-11? Not since 9-11. Uh, it, when, when uh, I would say back in the early 90s, I've seen a tremendous expansion of these activities since the early 1990s, and it has uh, moved forward in consistent fashion, become ever more sophisticated and ever more widespread. There was no sudden burst or flurry of activity uh, since 9-11. And you have no help whatsoever with the political arena in this, correct? The politicians will not touch this with a 10-foot pole? That's right. And... Even those who uh, purport to be liberally inclined, and I'm speaking about members of the Democratic Party, uh, will not touch it because, quote unquote, and they know they know what's going on. Uh, they don't. They simply don't have the funds to be able to pursue it. All sorts of humma humma excuses will be furnished for not pursuing something like this. And it, it, before you close, and I hear the music in the Go background. Ahead. Well, you can stay another minute if you want. Okay. It's up to you. Well, why don't you come back for two minutes on the other side of the break, and then we'll finish up, okay? Okay. I'll okay. be back with Julian McKinney in uh, three minutes on the Investigative Journal. Say something at the break. Oh, uh, I did. I want to thank you very, very much for taking on this, uh, this subject. There are so few people in the media. There is, as a matter of fact, you're the only one I know of who has the guts to address it. And, you know, it really doesn't, and I, just in, de, uh, in defense of every uh, media person, I don't think it's guts in a sense. Uh, maybe it is. I don't think, I don't consider myself in guts in this issue. I consider it to be an issue uh, that you need to take time to understand it, and that's what I would recommend uh, to the people in the, in, the, in the media that haven't touched this issue. Uh, if it isn't being downright censored, 
uh, by someone above you, then at least take the time to talk. I'll spend time talking to you about it uh, because it took me a little while to figure it out. And uh, I'll tell you what, uh, it's people like you uh, that need to be applauded because it's your efforts that are bringing this to the forefront. You're laying the credibility on the line. And, but I thank you anyway for your kind words. And uh, with that, uh, I wanted to say goodbye to you, and we're going to have to move on. And we'll have you on again to talk about this. And thank you so much. And thank you very much. Okay, that was Julian McKinney, and she was in, as an authority on uh, the use of electronic weaponry, microwave weaponry. And uh, she was with us for the last hour and a half. And we're going to continue. Sham, Liwasuko Asham and the Free Syrian Army, the FSA, started a counteroffensive against the Syrian Arab Army, SAA, Hezbollah, and the National Defense Forces, NDF, at the village of Al Wadihi in the Aleppo governance southern countryside. At the moment, the Syrian forces are holding full control of the village, but the clashes are spilling over into the neighboring areas. Separately, the militants launched a counter-attack at the strategic town of Jub al-Alma in the prophet Jonah, Jabal Nabi Yunis, of the northeastern Latakia, resulting in a series of intense firefights between them and the civilian-led NDF this morning. Unfortunately for the militants, the SAA were able to defend the town after a series of firefights and airstrikes from the Russian Air Force. This resulted in the death of over 20 militants from Harakat Ara al-Sham, Jabat al-Nusra and Liwasuka al-Gab. Elsewhere, the Syrian armed forces have been continuing their advance inside the town of Salma, capturing more blocks of buildings from Jabat al-Nusra in the southern district. As the clashes are going between the SAA and Jabat al-Nusra, both parties will strive to gain the upper hand in Jabal al-Akrad, the Kurdish mountains. A Russian airstrike killed the top Al-Qaeda commander Abdul Mohsen Abdallah Ibrahim Al-Sharek, a Saudi better known as Sanafi Al-Nasr, and two other fighters in Syria, reports said on Saturday. He was reportedly killed Thursday in an airstrike near the northern Syrian town of Dana, along with another Saudi and a Moroccan member of Al-Qaeda's local affiliate known as Jabat al-Nusra. Adrenaline and a sergeant with a megaphone, it becomes a bit more stressful. For the 132nd Military Police Company from South Carolina, stressful situations are what they train for. Sergeant First Class Earl Williams put together a course based on the South Carolina Criminal Justice Academy for the MPs at Camp Bonsteel, Kosovo. Um, while we're here, I just decided to implement it to some of my guys that, not, that are not civilian cops. Uh, so it's a lot of moving and shooting, it's a lot of um, one-handed firing, there's a lot of standing shooting and a lot of kneeling shooting involved with this uh, exercise today in this range. Specialist Kevin Blanton is an MP at Camp Bonsteel, but back home he's a supervisor at a company that makes electrical tools. He explains why this kind of stress shoot training is important. To be able to react fast to, uh, to different situations that may come up, if you need to pull your weapon out and fire to put a subject down, then you will be able to, you, you're trained to do that. Blanton is going to school to be a police officer back home and says this training will help him when he's ready for the academy. Reporting for the 121st Public Affairs Detachment, I'm Specialist Allison Pelletier.